Well, what a day. Welcome everyone to Mercy College. And Indra, thank you so much for coming. I'm going off script a little bit here. My name is Bernadette Wade, Chief Advancement Officer at Mercy College. But I also, I was not going to say this, but I have to. I worked with Indra for 17 years at PepsiCo. And I, I hadn't seen her in 10 years. And when we met just before, we had a little mini session of, wow, do you remember this and remember that? And it was indescribable, the experience working for a Fortune 50 company. Um, and I took those skills and uh, came here to Mercy. So to have Indra here is, it's almost surreal. And to have some of the Pepsi team here, it's, um, it's, uh, it's wonderful. So thank you all for coming. Um, as you know, Indra, well, I don't even have to tell you who Indra is. Um, we have a bio on, on the seats. Um, some of you received her book. And um, we're going to hear more about Indra's wisdom and Ava's wisdom as we go forward. Well, the fireplace looks beautiful. Isn't it nice and warm? And <laughs> it's so cozy. It feels so good. Um, and the, su the sun is still shining. So thank you, ladies. Um, Indra is a global leader. She rose to become PepsiCo's chairman and CEO. But there's other things that she does in her life and always has. Currently, she's on the board of Amazon, Memorial, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She's on the Dean's Advisory Council at MIT Engineering School. There's, there's many more. You can read them all. But it's, she, she, she devotes her life to um, looking beyond, which uh, I think you probably talked to the students about the importance of looking beyond their uh, education, the academic education and beyond. She's married. She has two children. And today she will share some of her insights uh, that she has developed over the years. Uh, about breaking down barriers of gender bias, inequality, and about being a mother in today's workforce. So welcome, Indra. We're Good so to happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you in the audience. There's so many, a variety of uh, friends here today. We have our students, first and foremost, our faculty as well. We have community partners, we have board members, we have administration, staff. Uh, so many individuals have come out to, uh, to listen to this conversation. And uh, we're thankful that you came out in the middle of a day uh, to be part of this conversation. So please silence your phones, just in case. And now it is my pleasure to welcome President Tim Hall. Thank you, Bernadette, and welcome all of you. It's great to have you here. I'm impressed especially to see students here during final exams. Way to go, yeah. <laughs> it's an honor to host a luminary and visionary thinker such as Indra Nui. She's one of that rare breed of leaders who can not only mm. see the changes that are possible, but lead organizations and institutions to make those changes. And those are two things that don't often go together, being able to not only see the possible change, but to lead a group of people to make the change. And she did this by demonstrating that it's possible for a corporation to be a good citizen in the world in addition to a profitable business. The good global citizenship is something that we try to instill in our students at Mercy College as they head out into their various careers. Mercy has a long, proud history, beginning with the Sisters of Mercy back in the 1950s, of educating students with the persistence, the grit, and the passion for learning and achievement that our speaker today embodies. Our students have broken through considerable barriers just to be with us today, and now they look forward to hearing strategies on how to break through even more barriers as they go forward into their separate futures. Mercy has steadfastly led the way in finding new strategies for success, which involved changing the way that higher education has traditionally served its students. 
and we're proving that it's possible to reframe the conditions of success for our students while preserving the quality and impact of a college degree. We recently received the Seal of Excellency from Excellencia in Education for our efforts to improve the learning opportunities and the learning conditions of our Hispanic students. We are the first, let me say that again, we are the first private college in the country to be so honored. And we're... And we're in our 25th year as a Hispanic-serving institution, the largest private minority-serving institution in the state of New York. Our efforts to improve student success extend as well to our black students. You may be tired, those of you that hear me regularly, of hearing uh, what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Mercy College awards more bachelor's degrees every year to black students than Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Dartmouth combined. <laughs> and I don't say that just because it sounds good, but because it demonstrates that the evidence-based strategies that we employ here at Mercy College actually make a difference. Not enough people know this. Not enough people know that there are things that unravel the chains that democracy and demo demography often entails, and that if we'll just put them into practice, our students will see more success than they have before in a world where we simply did the things that we had done for a century or two and never saw the positive results that our students deserve. So, the new global-minded citizens we are releasing to the world every year are proof of the success of these evidence-based strategies. We're proud that some of our alumni are working today at PepsiCo. There are also other prestigious institutions as well, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, American Express, Capital One, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, IBM, KPMG, Pfizer, and several top hospitals and healthcare institutions, NBC Universal and Viacom, and many more. Our graduates are contributing to their communities and to our world, and we hope they take the spirit of innovation which made their educations meaningful into their professional lives. I hope our students will pepper you with questions, Indra, as they seek new strategies for success beyond the doors of this institution. And I thank you again for the wonderful opportunity you're giving us all by being present with us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Our conversation with Indra today will be moderated by Mercy College's provost. She is the provost and vice president of academic affairs, Eva Fernandez. <laughs> Eva came to Mercy in July of 2022 and had close to 22 years at the City University of New York, where she served as a member of the faculty and administration. Ava's early interests in how people learn and use multiple languages led her to majors in linguistics and German at NYU. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And to advanced degrees in linguistics, linguistics at Coo the Cooney Graduate Center. Throughout her career, she has interacted with, a diver with diverse groups and striven to help others excel while cultivating a culture of empathy and inclusion, and in working to advance institutional change. As I mentioned earlier, Indra was the former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. She led PepsiCo to expand its portfolio of brands to include more nutritious foods, to limit its environmental footprint, and to empower its associates and people in the communities it serves. Indra is the recipient of 15 honorary degrees, but the best one is from the College of New Rochelle. 
right? So the first you all, one. You all know Mercy's the affiliation with the College of New Rochelle. So congratulations. The first honorary degree was from College Thank of you. New Rochelle. Thank um, you. And just one other point I thought I just would throw in there. Um, and her portrait was inducted into the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> She is the author of that book that you, we've been talking about, and you'll hear more about, called My Life in Full Work, Family, and the Future. And in case you think that Indra is all work and no play, Indra played guitar in a female rock band while in college in India, I believe it was. So there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Indra Nui and Provost Ava Fernandez. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Bernadette Wade, President Tim Hall. Thank you, everybody. I don't think I've seen this uh, incredible hall filled with so much excitement. I think that we're going to get some really cool things discussed today. Indra, what a pleasure to welcome you to my living room. <laughs> <laughs> I have never had this before. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Yeah, unbelievable. This what a great idea. We debated should it have sounds also so you hear the crackling and we decided yeah, against it. It, so, uh, it warms the hand very nicely. It, it does. Yeah. It does. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, so my role here today is really to channel questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we received some questions from the audience, um, and uh, thank you to everybody who, who sent them in. We'll probably have time to take questions from you at the end. Um, we really have so much to learn from your extraordinary professional background and your personal background, and I actually hope that we can start with the personal, mm -hmm. um, where uh, something you put out right at the beginning of your book, you say, I belong in both worlds. For a, for a linguist who studies bilingualism, that sparks my interest, right? Um, lots of dualities, competing forces, India and the United States, your family, your career. Uh, one of our audience members wanted to know about that secret sauce. How do you find the strength? How do you wrestle with the trade-offs? Somebody else asked very specifically, any regrets between motherhood and career? This is my struggle, she said. <laughs> Talk to us about these dualities. That could be the next hour. <laughs> that is the I book. Know. Well, reserve okay. some time because I have a second five question? other questions. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let me. Uh, I think that first of all, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know, be, being in PepsiCo for 25 years and living in Connecticut, I've never been in Mercy College before. So I actually feel like I lost out, not having been here before. So thank you for inviting me, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, I have to tell you that. When somebody was showing me my book today and saying, tell me a little bit about your life. I said, that's in the book. If you just read the book, my whole life is in the book. Don't ask me to repeat it because that's why you're holding the book in your hand. But if I had to summarize that book, it's about the improbable life of a person who came from a background that did not encourage women to go to work. Remember, I was born eight years after India got independence, after 350 years under British rule. So this was a new country I was born into. So that I could have studied as much as I did in India, allowed to cross the oceans and come to the US, somehow grew in the US environment, in the corporate environment, managed to become CEO of a Fortune 50 company, and stayed married and had two girls along the way, is in totality an improbable story, an improbable story. The only thing I'll tell you is that my story of becoming the head of a Fortune 50 company could have only happened in the US. I don't believe there's a single other country in the world, at least in the time that I became the CEO, where somebody like me could have become CEO of a major company in that country. So I owe a lot of my success to what the US offered me. So I owe it a huge debt of gratitude. And all of us, all of us should know that being here gives us a big start in life. And we shouldn't forget what this country can do for you and what you can do for it in return. We'll talk more about that. Let's talk about the dualities. Um, I left India when I was 23. Okay, so I've been here for 40 plus years. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I came out of India, but if I look in the mirror, I see a person of Indian, or Indian origin. When I talk, there's Indian in me. When I eat anything, any meal I eat, there's some Indian associated with it. Because you can't take the 
uh, the green chilies and the spices out of me, all right? And so <laughs> every aspect of me has got Indian, and every aspect of me has got the wonderful things of America. So I am a blend of both, and I live in both worlds because a lot of the value system that I was born and brought up with, I still carry with me, and I've taken imbibe the best parts of the US value system. And I am true to both, and I've never tried to pretend to be somebody different. And I think that's what's allowed me to be effective in my job because I never put on a persona to be a CEO. I never went on social gatherings in the weekend with the boys for you know, fishing in the Cayman Islands or golfing in Montana. I never went to those because I don't golf, I don't fish, I don't eat meat, I don't drink, I don't <laughs> horseback ride, I have kids at home. Why would I ever go to these events, right? I didn't belong to the social clubs. When I joined PepsiCo, they wouldn't allow women to be members of clubs. I say that in my book. So I had no network to draw from. So the fact that I just trade, stayed true to who I am is what allowed me to focus on the job and the family and move ahead. I didn't have the other distractions. But the fact that, uh, that you, you managed to blend in and to incorporate perhaps the best of both the cultures and perhaps the best of you as a mother and you as a, uh, a person running a, a Fortune 50 corporation. Don't paint me as, as a saint here because <laughs> I, well. I struggle with it, okay? Because you see, being a, uh, just working is a full-time job. I did three full-time, three or four full-time jobs being a CEO. Being a mother is a full-time job. Being a wife is kind of full-time at times. And then in the Indian context, being a daughter and daughter-in-law also adds enormous pressures to the job. No human being can do five or six jobs well. Unfortunately, women are born with this perfection gene. We want to do everything perfectly. So we sacrifice everything about ourselves, which I did. And so, um, it was a constant juggling. Every morning I'd get up and say, I know exactly what needs to get done today at work, at home. I'd make my to-do list. I'd show up at work in half an hour, the school's calling. Your daughter sprained her ankle. There just went my list. Or something happens at home, they always call the mom. And I'm no exception. Just because I was an executive in a company didn't insulate me from being the first person they call when the gym shirt was missing. So given all of that, you just juggle. You just hope you juggle all these priorities and the most important ones don't crash. And uh, you know, being a mother, you're also the, the biggest punching bag at home. And so anything that goes wrong, they always blame it on the mom. So I went through a healthy dose of that too. But if you have inner courage and inner resilience, you can, you can power through it. It's not easy. So, if I'm trying to paint a picture that it's a piece of cake, you can be CEO, have a family, keep it going, no problems, I'd be lying. That's... There were struggles all the time. It was juggling. If I didn't have a spouse that was so supportive, I couldn't have done it. If I didn't have my Indian family that showed up to help, I couldn't have done it. So the ecosystem worked. If I hadn't worked at PepsiCo, I couldn't have done it. Because I had bosses, I had people around PepsiCo who all chipped in to help. So it's that whole ecosystem of people that came to help me. So my success is not my own success. It is a group of people who all decided they were going to invest and their, uh, they're going to be vested in me and they wanted me to succeed. So I owe it to that whole ecosystem. We have so much to learn from all of that. Yes, we are, we are such the part of the whole. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, um, your approach to leadership, which I think is maybe related to some of the things you just said. Um, I'm so taken by the comments in your book where you talk about the relationship between power and humility. Mm. Um, and some relevant quotes. Uh, you talk about going out to capture the crown, but leaving it in the garage. <laughs> you talk about keeping the foot on the accelerator, but the other one on the brake. And you let feelings churn inside you, but uh, you present a calm exterior, right? So how do you... How do you become, uh, how do you learn to become a leader when you have that churning and, but that cherishing desire uh, at, at the core of who you are? We have to separate two things. When you become a CEO or a president of a company, that's a whole different ball game than when you're rising in the company. 
When you become a C-suite person, all bets are off. The world is looking at you, they're hoping you fail because the next person is ready to take your job. So the stakes are very, very, very high. So I want to separate that from when you're rising in an organization. When you're rising in an organization, the most important thing each of us have to know is, what is our proposition to the company? What is our proposition to the company? Uh, if they talk about Bernadette or Sharon or whoever else, they ought to be able to say, let me tell you what Bernadette brings to the table. And if that's not clear, then Bernadette becomes a safe pair of hands. And if you're called a safe pair of hands, it's got upsides and downsides. The upside is that you're a safe pair of hands until somebody else is knocking you out. The downside is that you're easily re replaceable because you're just a safe pair of hands. All right, so you have to be very careful when people refer to you as a safe pair of hands. Better off if you know what the proposition is that you offer the company or the organization you're working for. So people can say, I know we're having this meeting that has nothing to do with Bernadette, but let's bring her in because she has some interesting points of view. You want to get to that point, okay? So always ask yourself, how am I going to be a lifelong student so I can learn everything around my job so that I can offer a proposition to the company which I keep improving? People don't realize that. They, they assume that if you just show up at work and if you just get it done, it's okay. I, I always tell a story about uh, an incident that happened, I think in 97 or 98 in PepsiCo. I say that because this was a, pivot, a pivotal incident. Um, we were having a major investor meeting coming up uh, for PepsiCo. And investor relations did not report to me at that time. I was head of corporate strategy. Investor relations was separate. And uh, my husband and I were, uh, were on our way to Europe for a big PepsiCo meeting. And we were being invited to that for the first time. My husband didn't want to go. I had to beg and plead with him to take a week off because he works full time. He worked full time. So reluctantly he agreed. We're all packed. We're leaving the next day. And I'm flipping through this presentation, investor presentation, and I don't like it. Investor relations does not report to me, but I don't like this. So I go to the CEO and say, Roger, Roger Enrico was CEO. I said, Roger, did you go through the presentation? He said, yeah, it's just fine. He said, you look like you don't like it. I don't like it, I said. He said, you're, you're the kind of person that nothing satisfies you. <laughs> this is not that nothing satisfies me. I just think it can be made better. And he just looked at me with a straight face and said, if you think it can be made better, don't go to Montreux for the meeting. Don't go to Europe for the meeting, which is one of the most prestigious meetings. It's going to be fun also. Uh, don't go to the meeting. Stay here and fix it. But I want you to know that you are going to be enemy, the number one enemy of the head of investor relations. <laughs> because she's going to hate the fact that your rewriting has done. And he left. So I went home and I told my husband, we're not going to Montreux. He said, why the hell did you make me take a week off? <laughs> because I thought we were going to Montreux, but we have to, we're going to rewrite this deck. And uh, my husband, being the kind of guy he is, he said, fine, I'm going back to work. In any case, I wanted to stay back. And he went back to work. And I spoke to the head of investor relations, and I said, let me tell you where I think we can make a difference. We rewrote it together, and I made sure she presented it to the CEO, not me. We ended up with a pretty damn good deck. And I say this to you because my proposition was I would make something even better. Not because it's my line of responsibility and I was going to get a promotion from doing this. I put the company before me and I offered a proposition. And I didn't alienate my head of investor relations. She and I are still best friends. We still are. In fact, I'm doing a speech for her in Christchurch uh, in uh, no October, I think. So we've stayed in touch over the years. I say this to you because if you have a proposition, it's unselfish. You put the organization before you. and You're fine-tuning your proposition all the time. You will move up in the company. You will do well. And that's what people forget. So what do you tell to the person who says, well, I, if I do that, I might be swimming outside my lane? Yeah, you this will be swimming outside your lane. But <laughs> I think what you've got to understand is, this is your job. What you're not doing is going out there and doing something completely different. What you're doing is expanding the scope of your job to understand the connection points between your job and other parts of the company. When I interfered in that investor relations deck, 
It's not because I wanted to interfere. I felt it was talking about the strategy of the company. And I was head of corporate strategy. And I felt the job was pretty good, the deck was pretty good, but it could have been made way better. Okay, so my goal was, let's push to make it way better. If at the end of it you don't like the product, I will live with what you've got. But I think you're gonna love what we come up with. And so don't try to go and interfere in other people's work if your job is not damn good at what you're doing. Look, if somebody doesn't do the job they're given well and you interfere in others' jobs, then you're a climber. Those are the worst kinds of people, okay? Don't do that. Do the job you're doing very, very well. And then look for broader touch points from that to help others do an even better job. It's a very unselfish thing that you have to do. And it's so hard. It's it is so very hard to hard. get it right. Wow. Very hard. Well, so we had so many questions from the audience which were about exactly this kind of advice. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what are the things that we should be avoiding to rise? Uh, in order to rise in the ranks, what do you do and what do you avoid? Um, especially, what are the circumstances that apply to women of color? Um, somewhere in your book, you say that the world of work is still largely skewed toward the ideal worker of your an unencumbered male breadwinner. What advice do you have to uh, the, the many people at, at Mercy College? I, I, it was pointed out to me that you know, three out of five people are women of color, yeah. and they're entering the work, a workforce, that, a workspace that might be not so embracing. I think lots has changed since I went into the workforce and today. When I came into the workforce here, there were hardly any women. Definitely women of color were few and far between. And there were no immigrants from an emerging market then. India was not on the scene those days. So when I was at the Boston Consulting Group and I'd walk into a CEO's office with my team, um, they're probably thinking to themselves, at least that's what I could see on top of their head, that little cloud. <laughs> what the hell is she doing here? Okay, what does she know about my business? Remember, I was in the Chicago office, so I had all Midwestern clients who had never seen somebody like me. At least New York, maybe. But in the Midwest, they'd never seen somebody like me. And my clients were in Nina, Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin, La Crosse, Waterloo, Iowa. Can you imagine? I walk in and they're going, what the hell did you bring in? And so I had to win over people because I was more prepared, I had done more work, I had studied more. Incredible commitment of time incredible commitment of time. And I always say, I walked into every meeting in a hole, in a deep hole. I had to dig myself out of it just to be on a level playing field with the others and then distinguish myself. So unlike many of you, I told myself, I made a decision to come to the US. That was my choice. I made a decision to go into consulting. It was my choice. So I'm not gonna blame society for putting me in that hole. I made a choice to come into an environment where I was gonna be in the hole. But that was then. Today is totally different. Today is totally different that there's many more, there are many more women in the workforce. There are many more people of color in the workforce. So rather than being in a deep hole, you're in a shallow hole, but you're still in a hole. Because what happens is, the workplace, especially in the, senior, in the senior levels, not the senior most, it's sort of the middle management levels, is only now getting used to more women and more people of color in the workforce. And too often, I think, when people talk about DEI, they have wrapped it into a program and numbers as opposed to, this is a way to bring in the best and brightest from all of society. DEI is not about a social program. DEI is about expanding your reach so that you can draw from the entire population pool to bring in the best and brightest. That transition has not been made by many people. I honestly believe if you switch your brain to saying, I'm gonna wear blinders when I do my interviews, you will end up with a very different workforce than the way we do it today. And my experience is that when Steve Reinemann, my predecessor, put in place very strict hiring and retention criteria for people of color and diverse people, it actually made a difference in the company. And so I'll come back and say, yes, you're still in a hole. Women, women of color in particular, especially if you're a foreign born person of color, you are in a hole, but it's not as deep a hole as it used to be. There's more of us in the, uh, 
environment today and distinguishing themselves in many, many ways. So people are being accepted more than they ever have been. So I feel optimistic about the, the future. And as more women rise to the top and more people of color rise to the top, I think it's gonna make life easier for everybody else following. But again, go back, don't forget your proposition. And focus on sort of lifelong learning to keep your proposition fresh and sharp. And if you did that, you start to level the playing field and that hole starts to disappear. That's incredible. I, I absolutely love that. Um, I, I, I think that uh, you, you talk quite a lot in your book about mentors and the kind of um, help and helping you propel forward that you've received from people that have really allowed you to shine. Can you say a few words about that also in the context of, of how to cope with this inequitable workplace? Yeah, you know, mentors pick you. And I come back to this proposition. If your proposition is clear and you deliver on it, mentors pick you, you don't pick them. If I went to somebody and said, will you be my mentor, what can they do for me, really? They can't do much for you. But if a mentor picks you and says, you know, I like what I see in this person, I wanna promote them, I wanna support them, I wanna push them along. It means that somebody in, in your workplace who has a say in your career. And I think if I look across my entire career trajectory, in fact, if I look across my life trajectory, going all the way back to Madras in India, somebody would step out and with an indirect push, allow me to go to the next level. I still remember way back in, uh, when I was 14 or 15, I got a letter in the mail saying that I was picked to go to a 10-day program for training in democracy in India. Training in democracy, why do I need to go to a 10-day program? Um, and this 10-day program, every day in the morning, the best minds on the constitution or elections or what is democracy, what's parliament would come and speak to this group of 25 people. In the afternoon, it was dis art discussions amongst ourselves. And in the night, that leader would come back and talk to us about, okay, what did you all take away from this? First of all, the program was spectacular. But I often wondered who nominated me for this program because I didn't apply to anything. And I got this letter in the mail that all expenses were paid, I should show up in this military hill station for this program. Subsequently, I found out that one of the judges in the debating competitions in Madras, who sort of thought I was a great debater, put my name in for this program because he was asked to sponsor somebody for this program. So his company sponsored me, and I had no relationship with his company. His company sponsored me, and I went to this program. Now, very unselfish guy. Why did he have to do it for me? He barely knows me. Subsequently, I found out and I asked him, he said, when you came to debating competitions and I was a judge, I couldn't believe as the only woman how you held your own and told the other guys to just, you know, just get the hell out, okay? Because <laughs> the and he made your point. Never in a bad way. So he pushed me along. But that carried through. I had bosses at BCG who gave me paid leave when BCG didn't have a paid leave program. Nobody talked about paid leave. When I went to Motorola and Asia Brown Bavari, I had a German boss who did more for me than anybody else has done in my career. Um, when I was pregnant with my second child, I was working for him and he was in Zurich at the headquarters. And I, I fell sick at work one day when I was about three months pregnant. And when I came out of the home one day, his car and driver were sitting in my driveway. And I said to the driver, Frank, what are you doing here? He said, Mr. Shulma, I called him from Zurich and said, don't leave the driveway until she gets better. I go, why? Why do I need it? I'm going to go back home and go to sleep. He said, in case you have to go to the hospital. Mr. Shulma, I said, I should be here to take you to the hospital. I said, I have a husband. I have family members. Nope, Mr. Shulma, I said, I cannot leave this driveway. When my shift is over, that other driver is coming to sit in your driveway. Who does those things? Who does those things? But let me tell you the other side of Gerhard. When he left Asia Brown Bavari, and I'm sorry, when he left Motorola and went to work for Asia Brown Bavari, remember I talked to you about proposition? Um, the headhunter called me and said, Mrs. Dewey, Mr. Schulmeyer wants an Indra Nui. What is it? He wants to hire an Indra Nui. What does it mean? Because there was no job description for what I was doing for him. All that he knew was, he told the headhunter, I need an Indra Nui. 
And so he, the headhunter comes to see me, and we're trying to write the job description for what is an Indra Nui. <laughs> Ultimately, I got so frustrated, I said, you know what, I'll go join him in Asia Brown Bavaria. So I quit my job at Motorola and went to work for him. It's the proposition. It's what I did for him. And he just said, I can't do without it. I can't do this job without Indra, so you better go get me some other Indra. She's going to come to work for me. He became my mentor. He would deliberately, uh, he had to go speak at MIT and teach a class. Mysteriously on the day of the lecture, he'd say, I'm not feeling good, but I'm sending Indra. I'm like, what the hell do I have to do with MIT? I can't <laughs> teach a class. He said, yeah, you're going to do. Here's the material I was going to use. And on my flight to Boston, I'd be reading the stuff. What do I teach, you know? He just put me out there, sink or swim. But he helped me build confidence. But the thing with mentors, they have to be very secure. They should be willing to let you take their job. Because if the mentors get insecure and they're afraid you might outshine them, they'll never mentor you. You talk so, about selfless mentors in oh, your book, a, and that's exactly what you're describing. The most important trait of a mm. mentor. They don't care if you take their job. If you're a really good mentor, you will allow somebody else to take your job. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. I, mean, I think. Yeah. We all absolutely have to take heed from those words. Those of you who are in a leadership position, support a student, write a, re a recommendation yeah. letter, even without asking. And I think on those of you on the receiving end, saying yes when random things come your way, you never absolutely. know. You never know what's going to happen. That's wonderful. I, there was so much interest in uh, our audience about your great accomplishments leading PepsiCo especially. I love uh, your performance with purpose campaign and nourish, replenish, cherish. Um, in your book, you call this a new way to make money. Mm. Um, I love that. Talk to us about that. Well, remember, I took over in 2006. Um, and 2008, the whole world collapsed to the financial crisis. It was also the time when there was a lot of talk about obesity and what's happening to the public and um, you know, how do we make um, non-communicable diseases not so prominent in our society. Um, all of that discussion. But as I looked at the world and looked at where the growth lay, I felt we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're going to keep making the fun for you products, the diet products, the baked products, but we needed to add good for you products too because there is a market for more nutritious products. In fact, I'll tell you what I would have done if I was running any company during COVID huh, for a second. But I think that uh, I felt that it was a responsible thing to give consumers a choice, which also included good for you products as opposed to just fun for you and better for you. And the reason I felt that is because PepsiCo as a company knows how to make products taste great. Because the great thing about fun for you and better for you is like a Pepsi and a Diet Pepsi. We know how to formulate it so it tastes good. What I didn't want people to think is that if anything is good for you, it's got to taste like crap. So if we could bring our formulation capabilities to good for you, it'll taste great. At the same time, because we would produce things at scale, we could also keep the costs low. So the good for you didn't have to be that much more expensive. And because we had such fantastic distribution systems, I was hoping we could distribute the good for you widely so that it was ubiquitously available, value priced, and tasted great. So the consumer didn't have to make trade offs between fun for you, better for you, good for you. All of them tasted great if they came from PepsiCo. I thought that was the most responsible way to run a company. Similarly, I had trouble with uh, how much water we used in our beverage plants because many, many parts of the world, there's no water. In fact, there was a time in uh, in the early 2000, I'm sorry, in the mid 2000s, where there was no water in Atlanta. So I met somebody who came from Atlanta. Who was the person from Atlanta in this room? There was no water in Atlanta. There was a drought. We had a huge Gatorade plant that was shut down because there was no water. So one of the things I wanted to do was, rather than use two and a half liters of water to make a liter of Pepsi, I thought we should get it down to 1.2, 1.3 liters of water, and then work in the community to offset even that 0.2 liters through other strategies to save water. I felt that was what big companies like PepsiCo could do for communities. Because if big companies don't help, who's going to help the communities? And big companies should not be immune to issues of society. I grew up in a city with no water. Today, outside that city is a big Pepsi plant. 
That city still doesn't have water. A city of 10 million people still struggles for uh, water in the summer. But the Pepsi plant has pumps with stronger and stronger horsepower that goes into the aquifer and takes out water. But for the town, water has to come in tankers from hundreds of miles away. Makes no sense. So my point was, reduce the water use in all plants in water distressed areas, okay? Teach the town to do better rainwater harvesting, change agricultural practices, all of that stuff, and feel good about the fact that you have a license to operate in that society. It's simple. Otherwise, people shut you down, and our competitors' plants were shut down. And plastics, things would go into the landfill. They'd last forever. Today's landfill is the foundation for somebody's home tomorrow. That's what we forget. As towns expand, as cities expand, especially in developing markets, Today's landfill is the basement of somebody's home tomorrow. I felt that from a product portfolio, every child in the world should be your child. So what you would feed your child, you should be making. I felt every backyard should be your backyard. If you cannot put all the plastic in your own backyard, you shouldn't put it in somebody else's backyard. And then from a people perspective, from a people perspective, I just felt that People should come to work saying, I feel great about coming to work at PepsiCo. This is my company. And I don't have to be somebody else when I walk in the door. I can actually bring myself to the company. Because that's the way I operated. When my kids called, I took the call. And even if I was in an important meeting, if they called on something trivial, I'd always say, excuse me, and go take the call to my kids. Because for my kids, I'm it, right? My, 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 my husband was available, but he was working full time. And they wouldn't dare to call him. They wouldn't dare to call him. Don't ask me why. But they always call me. All right? Even he would call me. All right? So it was like having three kids many times. So my point is, that's the role I chose to play, because I chose to have kids. Right? And so to me, performance and purpose was about not trading off performance and purpose. Performance drives purpose, and unless you deliver purpose, you couldn't deliver performance. That was a virtuous circle. And that's all we were trying to do at PepsiCo. It's just a beautiful model, and empathy is baked right in, which... But it's also about making money, so I'm not trying to create a... <laughs> I am not trying to create a social enterprise. Okay? No, that's it's great. It's about making money, yeah. Making money through empathy. I'm, yeah. uh, sign me up for that. Yeah. So now we imagine that uh, that in in the future, well, we you already made uh, uh, alluded to it, a diverse back workforce that operates in an equitable and an inclusive environment. But we're not quite there yet. Mm. Um, uh, we're getting there. We are now. Some sobering statistics in your book, though. We are what 10% uh, women leading Fortune 500 companies. 12.2 now. 12.2, uh, 12, 12. <laughs> yes. I guess Google was wrong this morning. Yeah, 12.2. <laughs> Unless somebody quit before I got here. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> well, so, so one audience member wrote in, whether you think that we'll reach equity once the 50% of the Fortune 500 companies are run by women. I, I don't think that's the metric to use. I actually think don't focus on that metric because if I look at the pyramid, okay, and let me give you some numbers. In PepsiCo, the pyramid had about 15,000 managers at the low levels, entry levels. By the time you go to one level below the CEO, there are 15 people, and then there's one person as the CEO. Somewhere between the 15,000 and five levels up, you're going from 15,000 to five to one. So if you want to be a CEO, you got to work your way up this pyramid. It's a pyramid. It's not a cylinder. It's nothing else. It is a pyramid. Let me assure you. You got to work your way up. The world is changing around you, so you have to be a lifelong student to keep up to date with everything that's going on around you. It's hell of a challenge to do that. A lot of women are saying, I want to have kids. Now, people have said family is female. That's rubbish. Family is family. That's another... Uh, you know, vocabulary change we all have to effect. But to the extent that we plan to have kids, typically the person who makes a sacrifice is a woman. Doesn't have to be, but it is. I don't know at what point we'll get to parity where the men and women make equal sacrifices or at a point when we have support structures for families, for childcare. I don't know if we'll ever get to that, but we need to. But as long as there are people also making choices about family and motherhood, 
It's very hard to invest the kind of time and energy to get to the top. That's the, I, it wasn't easy for me. I never slept. I slept four hours a night. Okay, even now I barely sleep. I learned to speed read because if I didn't do that, I couldn't read everything that was put in front of me by extremely bright people and then add value to it. You know, I was always making to-do lists. All night I'd make to-do lists for the next day because kids, family, office, you know, all the to-do lists. It's a major challenge. And on top of that, if you're a single parent or if you have a sick child or a sick parent, okay, or if you yourself have any medical problems, how can you do it all? So be careful about saying, we've got to get a CEO parity. It is a tall, tall, tall order. I think what we ought to talk about is educating people in the workforce. So it doesn't matter who the CEO is. The path for everybody is greased so that you can be whatever you want, whenever you want, as opposed to, I took three years off to have a kid, therefore my career is stymied. Bring a return to work initiative back so people can re-enter the workforce. Tap into the whole workforce, leverage the whole talent base. But if we hold being CEO up as the only metric of success, it's gonna to be tough. You make it sound doable, actually. I think there's so much good advice If we in that. have that support structures Absolutely. and society has to build the support structures. So you started to mention uh, you know, the, what you would do running a company during COVID. What did you learn from COVID? And what can we learn as organizations to improve the care opportunities, I guess, that we have for, for people? Well, you know, I was co-chair of Connecticut's reopen initiative. So I had a front row seat to COVID and um, sort of lived through the seven states, uh, the northeastern seven states. We cooperated on everything. And a lot of the work we did in the little state called Connecticut went to other states too because our governor set up the commission much before anybody else. And uh, the, the several observations from COVID. The first one was I saw firsthand the yeoman efforts of caregivers. Okay, because what we all forgot was a lot of the nurses, the senior center caregivers went to work and they couldn't go home every night. Because if they went home every night and got infected, they couldn't come back. So they would go into quasi-quarantine and come into the hospital, and they'd be there for maybe up to two weeks. You know, I was at NYU. Uh, my mother was in ICU uh, a, a few weeks ago for a prolonged period of time. The doctors were telling me that the, they converted a whole floor to a dorm, so the nurses would sleep there. But what everybody forgot, the nurses had families too. Okay? People forgot that. The nurses had families. If they didn't have kids, they had their parents to take care of. They had somebody ill at home. But nobody paused and thought about those people. They were thinking about all those people dying of COVID in the hospitals. And I will tell you from my mother's ICU experience, she came out of it okay, from my mother's ICU experience, but for those nurses, my mother would have gone. People credit the doctors. The doctors were great, don't get me wrong. It's the untiring work of the nurses that makes all the difference in the care because they are there all the time, okay? When the patient is screaming for help, it's the nurse that shows up, always smiling, always cheerful. So I have great appreciation for nurses. During COVID, the fact that they did as much as they did was just unbelievable. Senior, seniors in senior centers were not allowed to see their families, remember? Patients in hospitals only saw families through FaceTime or a screen. That does terrible things to your mind, okay? When your routine is disturbed. Through that, in Connecticut, we saw the senior workers and the nurses and all the nurses' aides doing unselfish work, putting their families aside and coming to the workplace and just uh, keeping the population alive, I'd say. A lot of the people who got sick. So I have, I, I thought that was unbelievable. The second is, you know, we talk about work from home and all those initiatives. There's fundamentally something wrong with that discussion. I'll tell you why. If you are a person who drives a truck, stocks shelves, manufacturing any product, life-saving drugs or potato chips and soda, 
Can you do it from home? Can you hit a button and will the truck just run and stock the shelves? <laughs> I think, you know, we are talking about work from home as if it's the most, uh, you know, life-changing activity. That's for 5% of the workforce. The rest of the workforce has to show up. A restaurant worker has to show up. Can a nurse dial in and say, let's do it by Zoom, I'll take care of you by Zoom? <laughs> I don't think so. A doctor can do it. All the doctors are beginning to do more of that now through telemedicine, but the nurse can't because you are nursing somebody. You're not counseling somebody, you're nursing somebody. So I come back and I say, COVID has taught us that, yes, technology can take us someplace, but if you really want to be a servant leader, if you truly want to create an inclusive company, don't create two tiers of workers. One tier that has to come in, show up at work every day, work the hours through snow and rain and hail, and another group that is still debating, when do I come back to work and not? Now, let me give you the flip side. The good news is flexible work and hybrid work has actually made it possible for many uh, you know, young family builders to juggle family and home. That's okay. Those are choices you're making. And saying, I can only go to work three days a week or only two days a week. I want to do the rest by Zoom. If your company is going to allow you as a knowledge worker to do that, take advantage of that. But don't come back and say, I want to be on the same promotion track as the others. You can't. I'll tell you why. When you come to work and you actually interact with others, you learn leadership development differently. You learn how to work in teams very differently. You can pop into meetings and you can learn differently. Is this gonna create a society where women are gonna fall further behind? Yes, if only the women work hybrid and all the men go to work. Don't let that happen. You know, the companies have to make sure that uh, as many women that work three days a week, the men also have the choice to work three days a week. We have to make it more popular for men also to stay home and work from home or take care of the kids. It's not a bad thing, it's actually a very, uh, it's a noble thing to do because it builds better families. So we're going through a change in society coming out of COVID. I hope we look at this as a great opportunity to rethink how all of these dynamics are going to work. We're certainly rethinking um, how education is delivered, right? I mean, uh, learning is so social, so for yeah. it to happen in isolation of others through your computer screen is very different than coming You know, it's to interesting. We always thought that when you went to school or college, you learned all the hard skills. It's the opposite. You can learn the hard skills digitally. It's the soft skills you have to go to school for. That's you know, right. how could that soccer team have won a tournament had you not come to school? Think about it. Could you have done it online? Probably not. You didn't play fantasy soccer. You played real soccer. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, you're playing soccer, everybody cheering you on. You couldn't have won if your teams were not, your uh, Mercy College people were not cheering you on. So I think there's a lot to be said to build community with being present physically. I miss shaking hands with other people. Uh, you know, in Connecticut, we were all working through COVID, so I'd see everybody masked up and all that, but I miss the handshake. I miss people giving a hug, giving each other a hug. So the human touch is what I miss the most during COVID. It's, and, and it's so good to be able to, to, to do be that back, again. Yes, right? absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, and it, I haven't had COVID. You know, I've been vaxxed five times and oh. I'm pretty good. I'm looking for the sixth now, but you know what? I'm not, a, I'm not advertising vaccinations, but I've been protected, so I thank God for that. It's, it's certainly, it just makes things so very different. Mm. Um, and, and especially having gone through the isolation of the early phase, absolutely. how different it is. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about education, uh, mm -hmm. which you call the bedrock for advancing women in our world somewhere in your book. I think, I agree, of course, I'm an educator, and I think it's key to, to not just uh, getting people engaged in learning and entering the workforce, but also to generating ideas that then help to drive industry a little bit, at least. Um, tell us about your views on education as being a central thing for advancing women in particular in your own life, uh, you talk so much about it in your book. Well, there's the actual skills and the subject matter you learn, and then how you learn, how you uh, approach problems, how do you uh, think, all of that is also taught when you go to 
an educational institution, hopefully in person, how you interact, how you build connections, how do you network, all of that comes from being part of an educational institution. That's why we've almost prescribed a K-12 education and then an undergraduate education, maybe a graduate degree. The reason it's you know, regimented that way is because over the years, people have tried and tested multiple methods and this method works. Um, you know, some people are good at getting those skills without showing up at school. Other people need a heavier dose of that. I actually believe my best times in school and college were when I was interacting with all my classmates, building networks, and we still carry on those relationships today. Uh, even in PepsiCo, the fact that we could all meet and talk and have a good laugh made a huge difference. I'm not sure we could have done that on Zoom. I'm not sure. Although, who knows, technology might change so it looks realistic. I don't know. But I'm not sure I could have done it uh, in Zoom. Um, education today has to go through such a profound change. Eva. Technologies are changing so much around us. Um, the best example I'll give you, I was at a health tech conference in Chicago two weeks ago. And I was listening to one of the keynotes. And um, they were talking about chat GPT, stuff that's being talked about so much. And one of the medical uh, directors there put up a question. And he said, I asked chat GPT, is this uh, case reimbursable? You know, somebody had come into the hospital, and they want to know if that treatment is reimbursable. In the past, they would go look at the records, talk to four or five people, make a few calls to the insurance company. They put that question into chat GPT. It came back and said, yes, it's reimbursable under these conditions. Okay? And then they asked the second question. They said, could you write the justification for the reimbursement? And Chad GPT wrote in like 30 seconds a wonderful justification for the reimbursement. And all that they had to do was press, send. It was sent and came back approved. Let me tell you, if this happens, the people in hospitals and insurance companies who did nothing but handle phone calls and why it's not reimbursable, right, have all lost their jobs. And all the staff there who are writing the case for reimbursement just lost their jobs. Do you know lots of lawyers are going to lose their jobs? Because you don't need to write contracts. If you say, give me a contract to procure, you know, X, Y, Z, ChatGPT is going to print out a contract for you. Because it's a large language model that is looking at trillions of pieces of data that's been done around this space, reading it, interpreting it, and bringing it to some sensible writing for you. So I think that in terms of how we teach, what we teach, and what are the careers of the future, it all requires a rethink. Oh, it's, uh, yeah. it's actually terrifying and exciting at the same time. I mean, a I'm brave glad on the world. age I am because I don't have to live through it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is uh, terrifying and exciting. You're in, right. In some circles, uh, you know, we're seeing that maybe this is the opportunity for the humanities student who really knows how to ask good questions. Oh, totally, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's opportunities. Yet. But the humanities student needs a science student to write the code. That's the only difference. <laughs> yeah. Stay in the back, write the code. I'll take care of what happens right, after right. that. Oh, yeah. Chad GPT is so good at writing code. <laughs> at least the kinds of things I might ask it. So. That is true, yes. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. Well, so I wonder before we let the audience maybe chime in with some of their questions, mm. some very frivolous questions for me. I know sure. that you're, <laughs> so nice. you're a musician. I wonder if you've That's ever been- That's an extreme statement. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess two questions for you and they are different. One is what is your favorite kind of music? And then the other one is what music are you? If you were asked to describe your personality, what kind of music are you? I know I'm not classical or jazz or blues or rock and roll. I'm, you know what, I grew up, I'm a child of the 70s, okay? All the 70s music is me. One hit wonders. I mean, you guys were not even conceived of in the 70s, most of you. But I'm telling you, for us who are, you know, growing up in the 70s, I mean, I grew up with the Beatles, the Stones, the uh, Creedence Clearwater, oh, CCR, all these guys, yes. oh my God. And, <laughs> Uh, I'll give you, I'll date myself in just a second. Um, I grew up, I, mean, I don't think there's a single Beatles song that I don't know the lyrics to. And a few weeks ago, maybe four or five weeks ago, uh, I was at Yale 
uh, and to see Paul McCartney uh, speak. And then uh, four or five of us had dinner with Sir Paul McCartney in uh, New Haven. I mean, I'm sitting there, I am speechless, okay? <laughs> I'm absolutely speechless. But for me, this was the, the biggest thing that happened in the last decade. So last week, I was up at Yale with Stella McCartney, his daughter. She's big in sustainable fashion. And I was telling my niece, who's at Yale College, I said, you know, I'm going to Yale to interview Stella McCartney. And she said, is she related? No, I said, I, I, last week I saw Paul McCartney. This year I'm seeing Stella McCartney, this, this week. And she said, is Stella McCartney related to Paul McCartney? <laughs> I said, yeah, she's a daughter of, oh, that's so cool. So she was more interested in Stella McCartney than Paul McCartney. You see, two generations. He didn't care a hoot for Paul McCartney. He didn't want to show up for his talk. But they all showed up for Stella McCartney's talk. Okay? But imagine me growing up in India singing Beatles songs. The Beatles were sort of a flicker in my eye. Never ever thought I'd see them, leave alone, have pizza with a beetle. And there I am sitting in New Haven and Pepe's. Can't get that pizza bite in my mouth because I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I'm sitting one, you know, next to Paul McCartney. What if it, the pizza just drops on me? <laughs> and he's pretty cool about it. And so I'm a, I'm a product of that music. What a tremendous opportunity. I would have my loved God. to have been in Woodstock. Really? Yeah. Really? That's, that's really, I've watched that movie a hundred times. That's Woodstock. Woodstock. And your favorite song from Woodstock? Mm. Oh, wow. Uh, a lot of them. I mean, the songs that um, Jimi Hendrix was amazing at Woodstock, yeah? But even people like Matthew Southern, Crosby, Stills, and Nash were great there. Canned Heat, people they never know about, you know, uh, performed phenomenally at Woodstock. You know, I was watching the Woodstock movie from India in a theater where you could buy a ticket and you could watch the movie 10 times in the day because it opened in the morning, shut in the night. It was one of these watches much as you can, like eat, eat as much as you can in a buffet. It's one of those theaters. So I'd go there on a weekend and watch it all day again and again and again. I mean, I just thought it was the most amazing thing. And there was something there where I think uh, Arlo Guthrie or somebody says that I-87 is backed up all the way to 287. The cars, people have just abandoned it and they're walking to Woodstock. I had no clue what that was. Because I don't know what I-87 is, I-287 is. So I'm like, what could that be, you know? Now I live near I hate 287, <laughs> and I go, this is the spot. People ab abandon their cars. And if they walk from here to Woodstock, that's a long that walk. That is a long walk. <laughs> many, 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 many miles. But you know what? A little bit of, you can walk. <laughs> you can walk as many miles as you can. I'm not that kind of person. I don't smoke or drink, but I'm just telling you, it's pretty good, I guess. You just walk. That's great. Just That's walk, great. Yeah. Well, dedication to music will get you there. Yeah. Well, what about, what about sports? I love something that you say in your book about uh, how you needed to learn about football in order to, to mix yeah. in. But I think that you've been a, a fan of cricket your entire life. I mean, I used to play cricket in my college, and uh, I sit on the board of the International Cricket Council now. But... I love the New York Yankees. That is my number one team. I am ah. obsessed. I think if the Yankees lose Yankee like they territory. have been the last two games, I do not read the newspaper because I do not want to read how awful the Yankees were. <laughs> but, but since I know the Yankees management, I would send them a text saying, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and they always respond back saying, be patient, we'll come back, don't worry, it's just a temporary <laughs> setback. But to me, my happiness is linked to how the Yankees are doing. So that's a, it's a sickness I have. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I was not expecting that as an answer. I love it. <laughs> so ladies answer. and gentlemen, <laughs> pay close attention. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember going to Texas Stadium, uh, watching the Rangers play the Yankees. And they go, excuse me, sir, can I have a beer? You come to Yankee Stadium and go, yo, give me a beer. <laughs> and I'm sitting and saying, I'd rather have the yo, give me a beer to... Excuse me, sir, may I have a beer? <laughs> <laughs> Yankee Stadium is special. It certainly That's is. spectacular, yeah. That's great, that's great. Mm. I think I went there once to see you two play. That's oh, my okay. extent. 
Uh, so I'm looking at the audience because I know that we have time to take some questions from you. I think that we have a microphone positioned over there. Um, and while you're thinking about, um, about the question that you might ask, Indra, uh, something else that I found uh, very interesting in your book, mm. uh, when you uh, changed your wardrobe and things suddenly <laughs> changed for you. You want to say something about this? It's, uh, it's definitely my struggle. So I became CEO and you know, I used to wear skirts. You might remember Bernadette was this long because I'd never worn skirts up to the knee or shorter. I always thought my legs were too thin. And so I never wore skirts shorter than that. And my jackets were always a little big. Um, but somehow I felt comfortable in that. And um, you know, I carried on life. I became CEO dressed like that, pretty bad. <laughs> and one day when I'm doing a, a planned meeting with Gatorade, there was a consultant working on Gatorade you know, positioning and how you Im improve the image of Gatorade with sports. And he asked to see me privately. And I'm like, you know, it must be something tremendously important. And I don't even know how he had the courage to ask to see me, and I don't even know why I saw him. <laughs> but I did. And I said, yes, Gordon, how can I help? He said, uh, I would like to propose that you meet me at Saks Fifth Avenue Club this weekend. I'd like to propose a makeover for you. Now, three reactions are going through my head. First, I'm pretty happy with the way I look. Okay, so I don't need a makeover. Second, who the hell are you to propose a makeover? <laughs> and the third is, I've never been to sex. <laughs> I want you to know, until 2000, I have never been into sex because I thought it was just too hoity-toity for me. So I never went to sex. So now here's a chance to go to sex. So I sat there. I'm sure you saw all the emotions in my face. And then I said, looked at him and I said, fine, I'll give you a shot. So on Saturday morning, I showed up at Saks Fifth Avenue at 10 o'clock. Those days, they opened at 10, not at noon. And I went to the Fifth Avenue Club, and he'd taken the biggest room, and he'd set up all these outfits for me with jewelry, bag, and all that stuff. And he said, try it on, first one. I said, it's too short. I need it to be this long. He said, no, you're going to wear something just at the knee. And I'm wearing this, and it's a whole new personality. I'm like, who is this person staring at me from the mirror? And I'm actually coordinated, matched, not looking like I walked out of some men's Brooks Brothers catalog. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I dressed, OK? I'm just telling you honestly. And I kind of like what I see in the mirror, except um, I'm saying, Gordon, once you leave, how am I going to know how to dress? He said, I'm going to make a brochure for you, which has every outfit that you buy, how you mix and match them, and how you have a bag and shoes. I still kept that brochure. Oh, okay, I still kept it. He did a great job putting it together. It cost a lot of money, and I'm not used to spending that kind of money on clothes, but that day I did. Uh, so I bought maybe five or six outfits, which I still have, incidentally, and I learned how to mix and match. And uh, I learned how to wear those clothes. It made a huge difference. And um, I think that uh, one of the, my board members even said to me, ever since you changed the way you dress, uh, you know, it's more intimidating. Is that a compliment? I'm going to take it as a compliment. <laughs> you wouldn't. I would. You would. I'm, I'm taking it as a compliment. Because once you've made the leap to be dressed differently, you're not going to go back to wear those. Right? <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm wearing these lovely dresses. And then, you know, as is a typical illness we have in many parts of society here, I made my closet bigger and bigger to buy more and more clothes. <laughs> and then after I retired, I gave them all away. So, you know, it's like I went through this phase of plenty, and now I've shrunk back to what I'd like to be. So. And so many people will benefit, actually. Well, I gave them all away to Imagine people who are going to benefit. Being, yeah. being in Indra's shoes, literally. I don't know. But some of the shoes were never worn. <laughs> that's great. That's great. No, but yeah. it, is, it is certainly a very big lesson, again, in how yeah. important it is to... But uh, again, I looked at Gordon as a mentor of sorts. Yeah. He took a lot of courage. I could have fired him as our consultant had I taken offense at what he did. Why did he have to do that? It was like an act of God. He just came in and said, I, I feel like I should make you... Uh, you know, just appear a little differently. 
it's a, it's a kind yeah. of selfless mentoring Absolutely. of sorts. So, yeah. With, you know, with great risk, he did it. That's what I want to emphasize. With great risk, that's yeah. true. That's absolutely true. Any questions from anybody yes, here? I am so, oh, yes. Oh, a couple here. I, yeah. I guess we'll start in Blake. the front and then move. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, just touching on the topic of music and being a CEO, I don't, make, I don't mean to make anyone feel old, but I just recently discovered Pink Floyd. Um. <laughs> you just recently discovered Pink Floyd. Uh, did you like Pink Floyd? Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah. And do you know that all the new musicians just remake digitally the music of the 70s? You know that, right? There's, no original, there's no original music That's, anymore. That is so we own all that music. Era. I just want you to know. And um, I came across the song Time, and it's all about being present. So you were talking about juggling uh, uh, being a CEO and ha being a mother. So I'm just curious on how you were able to stay present dealing with all those different factors. Uh, not easy. I mean, you're present. I'm here. First of all, Blake, I'll tell you something. A lot of people who stay home with their kids are not also present all the time. Okay? People believe that stay-at-home moms and dads are always present for the kids. They're just awesome. Not true. Okay? Um, and... Um, I was present when it counted, at least that's what I believe. Although my kids would say there were times they would have liked to have me present a lot more. Although I believe if I was present a lot more, they'd say, just leave us alone. You're driving us nuts, all right? Um, so I was present for all the important school events. There's not a school board meeting I missed. If my kid sprained the ankle, remember I grew up at a time when the smartphone was not available. When my kids were small, there was no iPhone. iPhone came only in 2006 or seven. And FaceTime and all that came much later. So if the school called and said, your daughter sprained her ankle, I was the first mom who would land in school. Most of the moms would say, just put ice on it in the evening, I'll come and pick up your daughter. I would be the first one there. My daughter would say, why did you show up, mom? It's embarrassing. It was a school nurse <laughs> called me and said, you sprained your ankle. You see that? Was I present? Yes. <laughs> Anytime I traveled, if I went for two weeks, for every day of the week, I would write a letter ahead of time, mark it for the date for each of my daughters and leave it in the house. So they would have the letter. A lot of other mothers who had to travel couldn't do all those things. I would take the time, because I only slept four hours. Remember, I had 20 hours to think about all this. So I would write all these letters. I would leave stickers, you know. Pikachu stickers. Remember the Pikachu craze? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Hello, doll. No, Hello something. What was that? Hello something. Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty. <laughs> Pikachu. I went through all those phases. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You name it. I went through Raphael and Donatello like you will not believe it. Okay? So was I present? I think so. When my kids are in a good mood, they'll say mom was awesome. When they decide they want to use mom as punching bag, they'll say she was never there. She was building her career. We were ignored. My kids were never latchkey kids. One of the parents was always home every night. We always had family members at home with the kids. Okay? And my kids never went hungry. They didn't have debts. They always had a roof over their head. They always had a great meal on the table. I think I was a pretty good parent. So. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. You and then Sobeida. So in the I just want to say thank you for your time. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, when you first started, did you face any issues related to respect being a woman of such a high position at a Fortune 50 company? If so, how did you overcome them? Oh, a lot. I mean, um, you know, a lot of the men would roll their eyes when I talk. You know, you could see that. You could see that they, they are going, oh, there she goes again. Uh, they talk over you a lot. Um, um, they just cut you off when you're talking. Um, a lot of that would happen. I want to come back to the proposition I told you about. Those behaviors continue even today. Even when I was CEO, some of those behaviors continued. The difference is that when you're very junior, okay, you struggle with these and hope that the system changes, that somebody is watching the system and making changes so it'll make it easier for you. 
At some point, you become the person who controls the strings in the system. So you have to make the change. So when you're on a meeting and enough of a position of power, when you see people talking over a woman or cutting her off, you stop the meeting and say, guys, stop it. She's talking, let her finish. Or do you know why you're rolling your eyes when, the, when she's talking? Anything the problem? You know, so if the person who's in charge of the meeting doesn't stop the discussion right there and fix the issue and say to yourself, I'll talk to them later, not now, that defies the whole purpose. So the leaders have to uh, call it out right there. All right? If you did it then, then the message goes around the whole organization. Don't talk over other people. Don't roll your eyes when they're talking. And don't have this indirect signaling which says, God, when is she going to stop talking or when is he going to stop talking, okay? You can feel it in the room. I used to feel it, okay? Um, I would resort to things like, um, I would say something like, I have a lot of questions, but because you guys don't want to hear it, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about my questions. Then everybody's like, oh shit, what are these questions? We've got to know what they are, <laughs> okay? So at the first break, everybody's coming to me saying, can we see your questions? I'm going, well, since you didn't want me to mention it in the meeting, why do you think I want to give it to you now? Or I had another terrible habit. I would just go, hmm, interesting. They go, oh shit, then something is wrong. Okay? So little things like that, okay? Uh, the other thing is, the more paper that somebody turns into you, you know, the less work they've done to prepare the material. Because what the person who's reporting to me has done, even when I was president, I'll tell you, that person has collected the decks of five other people, put it together, stapled it, and given it to me. Right? Didn't have the uh, you know, presence of mind to look over the 500 pages and get it down to 20 pages to give it to me. But I'm reading all 500. So I go, you know, page 20 and page 40 have no linkage. Why are they both in the same deck? You know, page this and page this don't relate. Oh, but I didn't get a chance to read it. What are you, just a pass through? Why do I need that level at all if all that you're going to do is staple all these charts? So I'm giving you these as examples. You have to earn a place in you know, the higher levels yourself. It doesn't just come to you. And people in power have a very special responsibility to change the environment. If they don't, it's not going to happen. That's absolutely true. <laughs> Did you have a survey? Hi, I'm just curious in terms of your leadership style with your employees, your closest employees. Like if one of or two of them were here today, what would they say about Indra as, an, as wait, a wait, boss? Sharon is there and uh, Bonnet is there. What would you say? <laughs> there's two, one or two of them, there's two of them. Go ahead. <laughs> Sharon and Bernadette, go ahead. Say whatever you want to say. This is a question out of the blue, so I'm not going to be offended, so go for it. I would say, I would say she was um, tough. Very terrifying. <laughs> and fun at times. Um, very um, interested in everybody's lives. Um, for me, she, I had my daughter for the same age as her, so we really the whole thing together. Um, she demanded so much. It's true. So much. Right there, there. Um, so much. Uh, in terms of being present, getting the work done, understanding what we were doing in that particular job. We handled the internal communications of the company. And we, I remember I was talking to Sharon, I said, Sharon, do you remember when you started Intra Squad? And it was, uh, it was on the subject of a union worker, I don't mm. remember that. Uh, and, and, and so these were two things uh, while we were living on what I call the quarterly, um, the quarterly earnings. Um, yeah. the earnings. And, and our whole lives as a company, we're really geared towards the quarterly earnings. Um, and that is something that when I came to Mercy, and I was, um, this is a nonprofit, obviously, it's a nonprofit mostly, 
um, the difference between working for a corporate entity for profit and a nonprofit was astounding. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I said to myself, I really can't do this. I really can't work. I cannot work at a nonprofit because I don't have the resources. So under an interest organization, if we had an idea, oh, this was another one. If we had an idea, right, she would be like, go for it, go, do it, go. And we would just go and find the resources. We could make a phone call in the world and get, get the best, get the best consultant for, for resources, companies want to work with us. So, um, is very, very exciting, but challenging and thrilling at the same time. Uh, and so taking those skills and coming here to Mercy was unbelievable because I was trying, I was living in my corporate world with my corporate skills uh, and applying them in, in a nonprofit world. Uh, so my team, you can see why I am why I am. Um, that's <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, 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 that's amazing. Your team, okay. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned the nicest way. That's why. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to answer Pleasure. our questions. Um, you talked a little bit about how it was important for you to move towards sustainability. And I was wondering what kind of challenges did you face trying to get a large company to move um, towards more sustainable practices? And do you have any tips to us as consumers, employees, or future leaders to how we can contribute to this? Well, you know, um, sustainability is not so widely, was not so widely accepted. And even now, people call it woke, okay, which is really frightening. But at that time, it's like, to make the investments in sustainability, because sustainability doesn't happen because you declare it's a program. You've got to do all the investments to learn how to use more recycled plastic in bottles. What's the technology investments to make to reduce water usage? All of that stuff requires money. There are many who felt all of that money should just be given to the shareholders, forget all this climate change stuff. The science is wrong anyway. But the problem with climate change is when the proof comes, it's too late, right? Um, when towns are taken out or when you've got a mass migrant crisis because people don't have anything to eat in the deserts of Africa and they start migrating to Europe, you realize climate change can hurt you in tremendous ways. And so if everybody took climate change seriously, there'll be a bigger focus on environmental sustainability. So in my case, I had to convince people who would have liked to have flowed all of the profits to the shareholder without any investments, uh, and those that believed it was an existential crisis. And then you've got investors out there who would rather take all the money and invest in an environmental company. You keep doing what you're doing. So we had all of these constituencies saying, any money you make should come to us. You shouldn't invest at all for the future. So it goes to this duality I talk about in the book, which is performance and purpose, because one is essentially as Bernadette said, quarterly and short term. Purpose is by definition longer term. But what people forget is you cannot keep performance going unless you invest in purpose. That linkage is what people don't realize. And so uh, I think the critics were many. The funny part is when they went home and talked to their kids, their kids all talking about green initiatives. Um, so they'd come back, in many ways, the kids helped the parents change but there were more critics than there were supporters for a long time. So I'd say the first six years were more critics than supporters. The next four years were, oh my God, Indra was so prescient, kind of a talk. And then the last two years to now, you know, they're handing me every award they can think of. <laughs> but the first six years, I could have used some more support for stuff. Marcus, Marcus had a question. Oh, I think uh, on the second row, on the Second row, you were waiting? Yes? And then, yeah. yes? What did you, you want me to Sorry, uh, second row with the curly long hair? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, waiting. Indra, Pleasure. for being here. I'm an alum for Mercy, and I'm also a nurse. Mm. So I really appreciated all the um, 
And there's a bunch of nurses. There's a bunch thank of you. nurses thank in the audience. Yeah. So thank you so much for acknowledging us in, in your talk. I want to ask you, how do we raise a strong woman? I have a teenager. Um, I hear you had you have two girls, and I'd like to get some mothering tips on how, how do I raise this wild child, very smart, eager, strong, but how do I raise her to be something great? Well, I wish I had the manual for that. I really wish I had the manual for that. But I think the, the conversations around the breakfast and lunch table make a huge difference. Because if they constantly hear from you saying, you're a girl, you can't do this, or you shouldn't do this, or you should you know, temper your expectations or your hopes or dreams, they grow up with that sense that they should not dream big, they shouldn't soar, they shouldn't assume that they are equals and they should uh, aspire to be anything they want to be. Um, so I'd say the conversation around the breakfast table is important. Um, if there is a dad or a man in, in the family, the kind of role they, they play in the home is very important. Uh, I think in many ways I won the lottery of life because when I was a kid growing up, my father and my grandfather, big figures, basically put their foot down and said to my mother, our daughter, granddaughters are gonna be whatever they want to be. Let them dream big, let them go to school, college, master's program, whatever they want to be. If they get bad grades, we'll get them married off. But otherwise, let them, let them uh, dream and fly. So you've got to give that sort of a positive uh, you know, oomph to your daughter. Now, I will say something. A lot of people don't have the luxury of a family, okay? A lot of people are growing up with a single parent who's not always present because they have to have a job. Um, I think we have to worry about those people because they don't have role models, they don't have anybody giving them uh, you know, uh, uh, aspirational talks, nobody pumping them up when they do something good. I think this is where environments like Mercy College or school environments where you know, people who grew up in those disadvantaged circumstances can also get the same amount of positive reinforcement, uh, you know, support structure to be able to thrive like people who've got families. And you know, we have to go back and talk about rebuilding communities. We've lost that community structure where people reached out to each other and uh, somehow uh, you know, neighborhood kids would run in and, in and out of homes and everybody would get lifted. Uh, maybe that's harping for, you know, uh, uh, looking back and saying, I want to go back to those days when shows like Father Knows Best <laughs> existed. They're never going to happen again. So we have to create new structures that make that sort of life possible. But it all starts at the home. And if it doesn't happen at home, just doing it in the workplace, but they go back to a different environment at home just messes up the kids. That's beautiful advice. I know that you've been waiting, and I believe that this is the last question we can take. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, Dean De Los Reyes, uh, uh, visiting assistant prof in uh, nursing. Thank you again for citing the contribution of the nurses. Uh, my question is, you know, you've mentioned uh, that we really have to have uh, more affordable health care in this country. My question is that what's the urgent proposition now in order for our health care system in the United States to be more equitable, considering the disparities between ethnic groups? So, my that is, you know, you're asking for an um, answer. You posed a question upon which a PhD thesis have been written with no answer, <laughs> books have been written with no answers, and such profound change has to happen, okay? The reality is you've got a profit, uh, a expense pool that has been growing all these years. On a per capita basis, it's the biggest expense pool of any country in the world, but there are too many fishes feeding on that expense pool. The payers want the biggest share of the expense pool. The providers want a piece of the expense pool. Um, the companies, the pharma companies, the tech companies want a bigger piece of the expense pool, okay? And in the, in the process of payers, providers, 
suppliers all fighting in this profit pool, the patient has been kind of sort of kept aside. So if you have the resources, if you have damn good insurance, because you're contributing to this pool in substantial ways, you get taken care of well. People who don't have the means to contribute in outsized ways to this pool growing don't get access to the kind of care. Okay, and so I'd start off by saying there's so much inefficiency in the pool. If we fix the inefficiencies, it'll be unbelievable what we can do to overall health delivery systems. Uh, starting with electronic health records that work for everybody. We still don't have that. I don't own my health record as yet. If I do three medical systems, I don't have a common health record. Uh, and so, um, you know, one administrator told me, Indra, if we have all these electronic health records and systems that work, many people lose their job. Many of us have our jobs because the system is inefficient. We make more money because the system is inefficient. So this is the glories of capitalism and the dark side of capitalism. And nowhere is it more apparent than the healthcare system, which sort of puts care on the back burner, the word care. So it's a topic on which many, many books have been written. Hard for me to do justice to it now. But thank you for asking the question. Okay. Indra, thank you so much. Pleasure. I can't thank you enough, but I think uh, my colleague Bernadette is going to take us home. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. What all. a wonderful conversation. I felt it could go on forever. So thank you. Okay, Jade and Marcus, come on up. Um, I am Jade Wazihula. I'm a freshman here, majoring in public accounting. Hi, I'm Marcus McKinney. I am a business administration finance major. Ms. Nui, on behalf of me and my fellow Mavs, I want to thank you for coming here today and for meeting with us earlier. Thank you for having me. You are truly an inspiration, and you have been very, very great to us with all your wisdom today as we embark on our next journey. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 So that concludes our program for today. It went fast, didn't it? Right? Right? Thank you, Indra and Ava. Thank you.